it's interesting that, that even in a country like India, which of course is known for having a strong services sector, that there are still areas in the service uh, sector that, um, that have uh, low productivity, which means potential for increasing that productivity and increasing employment. Um, the next step, let's turn to China now, the, the other big country in, um, in Asia. Um, to address that, uh, uh, we have here with us today also Lee Kamakiyama, who is the co-director of the European Center for International Political Economy. Uh, besides having a really cool name, um, from, particularly for us Asian hands, <laughs> um, Hosok is, uh, is, is an expert on Far East relations, work, uh, which worked on WTO issues, um, on China um, technology trade issues, uh, and also on trade and services. He's also filled a number of, uh, of uh, EU um, uh, positions. Uh, so, without further ado, thank you very much. And um, I also would like to thank Bob and um, well, it's uh, as you heard, I'm European, I've worked with European policy all my life, which I think I will be the token nation of this panel. And in that capacity, I'd like to say that, well, first of all, uh, much of Asian economy is yet, or at least lagging, uh, to transform into a service economy. Well, the Western hemisphere, if you look at the EU and the US, we're looking at approximately about 80% of GDP coming from services. But, it's actually only Japan and Singapore that even come close, uh, and even them are around 70% of the GDP. If you look at Korea, which is extremely advanced and actually on, on an average richer than Europe, uh, they are still at 58%, and China is the real outlier in this context. 43% of GDP coming from services. Actually, the agriculture sector employs as much as the services sector, and these levels are very similar to many of the least developing countries and quite equivalent to countries like Cambodia and Ghana and it's not a very flattering picture. And there's also several reasons why we have this lag in development of services or why this is so difficult. Of course it's closely linked to the level of development, uh, the economic development in Asia per se, but there are other more structural or cultural issues as well. And first, the regulation, whether we're talking about unilateral or through FTAs or RTAs, uh, it's just seems to be much, much more difficult than services because, well, like MTB, some uh, aspect that affects goods, what we see in uh, many countries, including China, uh, is that they have a completely different view on responsibility. We heard, for instance, about the issues like on the cross border data flows in the previous panel uh, about the privacy and the conflict issues. Uh, we tend to look at them as a private responsibility of the economic actor in the Asian economies, even the developed ones. The, the first instinct is to actually blame the regulator. It's actually the regulator responsible. So these service regulations become extremely difficult. And the uh, second thing is, of course, the economic climate. And uh, even uh, countries that are relatively open, Singapore, uh, find this extremely difficult to open up, in, for instance, in the financial sector, uh, believing uh, or well, the, having the misconception that you might actually import the European economic crisis or global crisis if you let foreign banks and open up in Singapore. Obviously, this is not the case. Uh, Banks uh, run into a crisis because, well, they, they buy bad debt. And if you don't believe me, I have some Greek 10 year bonds that I would like to sell to you. <laughs> and, and the third one, which is perhaps the most important one, uh, is the, the Asian economic model. And the, I'm talking about the export level growth, focusing on maximizing manufacturing trade surplus. And this has, of course, put China uh, into, well, left exposed to external volatility and in deep need of rebalancing. And uh, as we heard, um, it's, it's not only China, it's many, uh, many countries, Asian countries, and even developed countries that are suffering from the same malaise. And this business model is simply unsustainable. And uh, well, there is a glass ceiling that you reach in the manufacturing sector in China. Uh, there is a need for increased value added and also reducing our cost and which can only be uh, delivered through uh, increased part of the services economy taking over. 
And uh, once you have the urbanization that's starting and, uh, and this, this momentum, you also run into the problem of employment. And now in China, 20 million people enter into uh, uh, the, uh, the working age every year. So there are, you need to create 20 million new jobs. And uh, well, that, that's a task that you know you, you can only lose one or two elections over that. And uh, even at this level of growth that we see now in China, they can only deliver half of this through manufacturing at this level of growth. And which leaves currently uh, one third of the working force coming from services. It's it 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 stipulates that basically that. Um, uh, the most of the new job has to come through services. We're talking about basically, if you project the, 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 the current five year plan, half of the population will be employed by services before 2020. And that, if you back reverse engineer the figures, means that the service sector in China needs to grow 20% per year. They need to reach 1 trillion US dollars in external trade in services, and that's in tripling today's rates. And that's basically exceeding US as a trade uh, um, a trading nation in services. Is this doable? I don't know. And um, after all, if you look at the, the service sector growth in China, it's around 10%, more or less on par with the, the rest of the sector. And most of the services sector, actually more than 50%, come from real estate. And which is basically attributing just to the, the, uh, the bubble, and which is not the high value add part of the services sector that the, the, the China needs. And it's very clear that they can't, for this time, this is actually the first economic plan of China, where they can't grow themselves out of the problem and just sweep it under the carpet. Basically, it's a do or die. If they don't leave with these jobs, basically 100 million jobs over the coming 10 years, there will be social unrest. There will be economic stability that will have political impact. So you can't deliver these 100 million jobs without opening up. And the question is who they will open up to, how they will open up. And maybe we can save that discussion for later. Take this panel. Thank you very much. It's a great overview. And uh, it also shows just uh, how, how important uh, service mobilization is for countries like China and other countries in the region as well. Um, we now have uh, uh, two panelists who will be looking at uh, more sectoral um, uh, uh, issues within the, the context of Asia, uh, the Asian region. Uh, the first is uh, Greg Frazier. He's Executive Vice President and Chief Policy Officer of the Motion Picture Association of America and PAA. He has a extensive background uh, Hill, uh, working uh, in the government at the, at the uh, Department of Agriculture as well as USTR, where he is the Agricultural Ambassador. Um, and he has, uh, under his belt, a very impressive uh, success uh, in um, opening up the, uh, the market in China uh, to, uh, to motion pictures um, in, a, in a landmark agreement that, that expanded the film industry's access to the Chinese market. Uh, right. Thank you. Um, I wish I could take credit for having it under my belt the success of that landmark agreement. Um, because I, I, I am profoundly happy to have played a role in it. But one of the lessons I want to leave with you is it was a true partnership, not only in the industry, but Ambassador Morantis's office, the General Counsel's office, the China office. We hear a lot about private government cooperation. And I, I submit this is one of the finest examples of government private sector cooperation that I have encountered in my many years of being involved in government and working in government relations. This is truly a success story. Uh, it's an unfinished success story. I want to talk about it. I wish I could hold it out as a case study to some of you in other businesses or private sector or what have you. But it's really unique. The China market, not presenting, is, is, is a unique market. It is particularly unique 
for the motion picture industry. So while a lot of the things that we dealt with and are dealing with are unique to that market and unique to us, and may not translate, I think that there are some broad general themes that are applicable. I've touched on one. Government, private sector cooperation. Secondly, one of the previous panels, panelists earlier this afternoon talked about the business community being somewhat jaded with WTO. Presumably, I, 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 I believe talking about negotiations. But this is truly one example where the dispute settlement process worked. Yeah, it took a long time, but it worked. And it's showing immediate results. After the agreement was done in February, I penciled out some calculations. And I calculated that the US film industry would earn 300% more this year than it would have the day before that agreement was concluded. And the agreement didn't take take effect until April, effectively April 1st. 300% more. They said, this is a real success story and it's having immediate benefits on the US economy. So let me talk about, if I could, in talking about this, and what we did, and, and some of the lessons you may glean from this. This will give you a little bit of perspective here. The United States theatrical market is about $9 billion, plus or minus. The Chinese theatrical market, when I say theatrical, I mean going to a cinema, buying a ticket, the theatrical market, will this year probably hit $3 billion. It will be the second largest theatrical market in the world. If you would have made that statement three or four years ago, even the film industry professionals would have been laughed out of the room. Now, admittedly, in comparison to the U.S. market, there's a big gap. But as in all things China, one must keep things in perspective. The Communist Party took power in 1949. It banned foreign films. There were no foreign films in China until 1994. So all of this development has taken place from 1994 to now. In the last five years, the box office in China has grown 350%. 350%. The admissions, a key factor, the number of folks that are going to the movie, has gone up over 120%. The Chinese exhibition community, the people, the AMCs, well, I guess AMC is not Chinese, Chinese company, Cineflex, those companies, they're building eight screens a day. Eight new movie screens a day. There's no place in the world that comes even close to So over the past decade, when you've talked about the U.S. film industry in China, we were sort of the poster child, the iconic image of intellectual property rights problems in China. And don't get me wrong, they still exist. And that's how folks thought of the U.S. movie industry and China. As I said, those problems still exist, but it is the fastest growing market in the world. For those of you in the business community, I, say, I dare say there's not one of you who has a renegotiated contract that's been in place since 1994. Not one. <coughs> Except for Paul. And in spite of all of this growth, there are more films that open in the United States every weekend in the summer than are allowed into China in a year. So the point I want to make about the dispute settlement process is think creatively about how you can use it, how you can leverage it. That's what we did. We put together, we, USTR, put together a wide-ranging case. The objective was to get China to negotiate with us on those key points. We've been doing this business deal in big place since 1994 and get access to the fastest growing market in the world. It was a long process. It was a process 
with some commercial and political peril. One of our members distributed the most successful Chinese-made film outside of the United States. That same company distributed a film that was critical of the party and the government. And its reward for those two were it was excluded from the Chinese market for seven years. So it was not an easy decision for these executive heads, these, these executives, these studio heads to say, punch China in the face, but they did. <coughs> Today, Chinese WTO cases, they're not routine, but they're not unprecedented. They're not unprecedented. This was the fourth case in the United States of robotics. I can remember going to Capitol Hill one day with a group of my colleagues or associates in the trade association community with a member of Congress who was talking about we need to get tough on China and on and on and on. And then he looked around the room and how many of you are willing to go to the WTO? Everybody in the room sort of sunk back in their chair. So, you know, that may not exist today, but it is it was a courageous decision at the time for the industry to step up and make it, you know, and to use it on a high profile case. So I guess if I could leave you with a, a couple of lessons. In spite of the fact that the uniqueness and the differences for the audiovisual industry is, the speed settlement process can work. Those of you in the audience who are true China hands, I don't consider myself one having only done this for 15 or 20 years. Perseverance, patience, one step forward, maybe one step sideways, and we're in a sideways step right now in spite of the success. And as I said at the outset, the cooperation of folks at USTR is indispensable. Indispensable. The folks over there make some crucial decisions at some of the crucial negotiating points that got us the deal that we did. One thing, as I said, U.S. industry will learn 300% more than the Supreme Court with that If you look at one film, I hope most of you saw it, that came in under the new agreement, it's going to earn $10 million more under the new agreement than it would have the circumstances of February 17. So this is, again, a real success story with meaningful, real results here. Thank you very much, Amy.